and welcome to the second in this data protection mini series aimed at charities for preparing for the end of the Brexit transition period on 31st of December 2020. I do recommend that you watch the first video in this series before having a look at this video because there are quite a few concepts that I am going to assume you're already familiar with that we cover in that first video. This video is focusing only on data transfers between the UK and other countries. We'll look at countries in the EU and countries outside of the EU and the UK. So this video is for you if you are a charity or indeed another type of organisation based in the UK and you transfer personal data to or receive personal data from a country outside of the UK. If you never transfer out or receive in personal data from overseas, you don't need to be concerned with this. And you can stop watching now and tick this off your list as one thing you don't have to worry about. What I would say, though, before you merrily rush off, is that you should be very careful to think about where your suppliers are based and where the data that you might share with them is, is processed. So a lot of the cases where you're contracting with a company that you might assume is a UK company, perhaps their servers aren't located in the UK, which means that your data will be transferred outside of the UK, even if you aren't doing that transfer yourself. For those of you who are miffed that you're still here having to consider this, there is one other exception um, where you're transferring personal data to or from consumers. So although we don't necessarily think about consumers in the charity concept, uh, in the charity world, particularly as a concept, an example would be, for instance, if your charity is organising a conference in the UK and you're taking bookings from people who are located outside the UK. So you'll be transferring personal data back and forth um, across borders as part of the booking process. Um, that sort of transfer isn't what the GDPR calls a restricted transfer. So again, if that's all you do, that's the only type of cross-border processing that you do, also stop watching and feel relieved that you don't need to worry about this topic. Again, though, slight caveat, before you, you merrily go off uh, with, a, with a smile on your face from that perspective, sharing employee or staff data between group charities is a restricted transfer. So if that's the kind of sharing that you're doing, uh, as opposed to consumer sharing, uh, then watch on. So what do charities need to do? And I think this is the area where there will be an amount of audit required. And the amount of audit work required will depend on the current state of your records of processing activity or what is often called ROPA. So that should be a record that you keep or for most charities will be required to keep under the GDPR of exactly what types of data they collect and use, uh, who they share it with, where it goes, where it's stored, etc. So the very first step has to be to have a good handle on what kind of data flows in and out of your charity to other countries. So I think you really have to plot out, firstly, what personal data do you send outside the UK? Who does it go to and why? And where is the recipient based? And then secondly, the reverse of that, what kind of data do you receive from countries outside the UK? And again, who are you receiving it from? Why are you receiving it? Where is the sender based? Now, if you think that's going to be a very time consuming job because you do quite a lot of cross-border data sharing and it's not something that you've already done, I would say prioritise first transfers of personal data in to the UK from countries overseas. And you'll see why I say that in a moment. And as usual, prioritise the most risky types of transfers. So anything involving very large amounts of data confidential data, sensitive or special category data, you know, data about health, 
political opinions, race, etc., or criminal offence data. So moving on to what's actually changing when the end of the transition period comes. Well, looking first at transfers of personal data from the UK to countries overseas, this is relatively simple, or at least not much is going to change. Transfers of data from the UK to the European Economic Area will continue to be permitted under the UK GDPR. And again, that's a concept we, we talk about in the first video. So if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about the UK GDPR, pause this one and look at the first video and then come back. Basically, the UK is designating all member states of the EU as adequate for data protection purposes. So you can continue as you already have, to transfer personal data out to EU member states without putting any extra protections in place. Transfers of personal data from the UK to a country outside the European Economic Area, again, doesn't really change. You should already have measures in place to safeguard those transfers unless one of the limited exception applies, exceptions apply, and, and you can continue to rely on those safeguards. Turning to transfers in of personal data from other countries to the UK, that is less straightforward. And that's why I said a moment ago that when you are auditing your flows of personal data, prioritize the flow of data in to the UK first in your planning process. So again, looking first at transfers in from European Economic Area or EEA countries, once the transition period ends, so come 31st of December this year, the UK will be a third country for data protection purposes. So just like at the moment, you have to put in place safeguards before you can transfer personal data to countries outside the EEA. After the transition period ends, EEA countries will need to put in place those same types of safeguards before they're allowed to transfer personal data to the UK. The hope was that the European Commission would give the UK an adequacy decision before the transition period was up. Some always said that was uh, slightly pie in the sky, but um, regardless of what your opinion was, here we are um, recording this at the beginning of November and an adequacy decision hasn't been granted. So I think we have to assume that one will not be in place by 1st of January 2021 and prepare on that basis, particularly because we know the UK's surveillance laws and practices have been subject to some attention and criticism by the EU courts and institutions. So assuming there is no adequacy decision, I'm also, for the purposes of this video, going to assume that your organisation doesn't have binding corporate rules or BCRs in place. That's quite rare in the charity sector. Um, mostly BCRs are used by large international corporate groups. So assuming there's no BCRs, assuming there's no adequacy decision granted by the EU. The next most likely thing you will rely on are the European Commission's Standard Contractual Clauses, or SCCs. Now, many of you will be familiar with the SCCs and might use them already to transfer personal data from the UK to countries outside of the EEA. And it may well be that the SCCs can be used in order to transfer data from the EEA back into the UK after the transition ends. It does leave us in a potentially tricky situation though, if you have a processor based in the EU, because there aren't actually any standard contractual clauses available at the moment for transferring personal data from an EU processor to a controller in a third country. At the moment, there's any controller to controller agreements or a controller in the EU transferring data to a processor outside the EEA. Now, this isn't a new problem. It's been the case for uh, a long time. There's been this gap in the SCC provision. It applies equally where processors want to transfer data to a sub-processor outside of the EEA. Uh, there's, there's no SCCs available uh, at the moment for that. Now, in practice, what lots of organisations do where there's no other derogation or exemption available 
is that they will adapt the controller to controller SCCs and use those for their own purposes. I would caution you though to think a little bit about the risks of doing that before you take that option because technically that's not a lawful way to share personal data cross border and if the data is large scale potentially risky for some reason then it may be that your charity is not willing to take that risk. And another added complication, unfortunately, with the SCCs is the recent European Court of Justice case, um, the decision in the Schrems 2, Max Schrems 2 case. Um, anyone who's been following that will be familiar with the comments on the US Privacy Shield um, and, and the fact that that's no longer a valid way of safeguarding data transfers between the EEA and the US. But that decision also made comments on the SCCs, the standard contractual clauses. And the upshot is that before you can use the SCCs now, you need to make a risk assessment of the data protection laws and protections in place in the third country before you can make the transfer. Now, again, as with the SCC issues, these aren't Brexit specific matters or concerns, but they are likely to make some of your preparations for the end of the transition period a little bit trickier. Finally, looking at countries outside of the EEA that currently have a European Commission adequacy decision, effectively meaning they can be treated as though they are part of the EEA really for uh, data transfer purposes. That's quite a odd group in many ways of countries that, that have applied and have been deemed adequate. New Zealand, Switzerland, Israel, uh, to some extent, Canada and Japan uh, and others. Now, these countries, because they have been deemed adequate by the EU, are likely to have their own quite rigid or strict um, data protection laws in place. And that's likely to put in place restrictions in those countries on, on them transferring personal data to countries outside of the EEA that they don't deem to be adequate. So that's probably going to be the UK. Now, the idea uh, is that the UK will put in place arrangements with each of these countries to maintain data flows from 1st of January 2021 onwards. But uh, according to the ICO, this is a work in progress. And if those arrangements aren't in place in time and your charity does receive data in from those countries, you'll need to decide how to comply with those local laws in those countries to continue being able to transfer personal data lawfully after the transition period ends. So just to recap, the audit is the first step. You have to understand where data is flowing in and out of the UK in, from your charity. Then you can decide what safeguards or exemptions could be open to you. Then you decide which ones are the best if there's an option and you put in place necessary arrangements. You will also need to think about you need to update your records of processing, your ROPA, do you need to update your privacy notices, you need to update contracts and MOUs etc.